Hello, welcome back scientists. I'm excited that you're joining me again. This is lesson two of the sixth grade Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate Unit. If you haven't watched lesson one, you should go back and do that first because it introduces the investigation question that we're going to be doing throughout this whole unit and it's really important. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing is that you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need something to write with, something to write on. I have a notebook and a pen that I was using during lesson one. If you have the same notes that you were using then, that's great. Pull them out. If not, get some fresh paper. It's fine. You could also use a packet. There are some um, schools that are going to be giving out packets to go along with this lesson. So you could talk to your teacher and ask about getting one of those. Okay, and the most important thing is for you to have someone to talk to. It could be someone in your house that you're actually in the same room with, or if you have a way to get a hold of a friend from your class, either a text or a phone call, and you could watch the lesson together, it's just really helpful to have someone to talk to. That's how scientists do their best work. Okay, let's get started by looking at some data. As you'll remember from lesson one, the question that we're trying to understand is how come the air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand is colder during El Nino years. The farmers there really want to know why this is happening so they can prepare for it. And so let's just start by getting a little bit of data from the farmers themselves. So this is what we know. We know that the average air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand during a normal year is represented by this blue bar and during the El Nino year it's represented by the orange bar. So let's just pause a moment and take a look at this graph in a little bit of detail. There is a vertical line that has some data and it mentions that it's in degrees Celsius and each one of those little notches is two degrees Celsius. And then the, the horizontal line is showing the labels for the two bars. The blue bar is the normal year and the orange bar is the El Nino year. So when I look at this graph, I can see pretty clearly that during a normal year, the average temperature is 12 degrees Celsius and during an El Nino year, it's only 11 degrees Celsius, which really doesn't seem like very much. That's only one degree Celsius. So I wonder how much that's really affecting everything. So that's one thing that I kind of wonder about. So on the right side of the screen, it just mentions that El Nino events occur every two to seven years. And there's a shift in the climate across the tropical Pacific, which causes some areas to become cooler than usual and some areas to become warmer than usual. Here, I'll move my picture over there. So that is sort of a definition of what El Nino is, but it's hard for for us when we use Fahrenheit more frequently to understand how cold really is 12 degrees Celsius. Is it like super cold like Antarctica? Is Christchurch, New Zealand like Antarctica? And so having a better understanding of Celsius and Fahrenheit will help. So I have this handy poster which has conversion. So let me pop my screen out a little so you can see. So when we look at this, I'll try to see over the top, you can see right here that 12 degrees Celsius is 50, 53.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So 53 degrees doesn't seem like super warm. When I think about a warm day in Seattle, I would think 75, 80 degrees. That seems nice and warm. But in the winter, temperatures in Seattle can get, you know, down to the 40s on a normal day in like January, February. And so the thing to remember is that this graph, and we'll come back to it, is actually telling us the average. And so remember in our thermal energy unit that we just finished, average takes into account all the different data from all the parts and then um, adds them all together and divides by the number of numbers. And so that 12 degrees Celsius is actually representing every day in January, every day in February, all the months, even July and August. So in some months, the temperature is going to be really high and other months it's going to be really low. But when we find the average, it's 12 degrees Celsius or about 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Did you see how I rounded that number up just a little bit? So it seems like pretty similar to Seattle weather, actually, because if you average out the warm days in July and August where we have 80 degree temperature and the cold days in January that we have 40 degrees, it seems like 
54 degrees Celsius. Oh, whoa, that's really hot. 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 degrees Celsius is pretty similar. So that's helpful for us to understand. So now we're talking about one degree difference. So if I look at my, my chart again, let me zoom back out so you can see it. If I look over here, I can see that, um, oh, that doesn't really help me a lot. But if you look at the difference between one degree and the next, it doesn't just tell me how many degrees that is, but um, you can see that the difference between one degree Celsius and a degree Fahrenheit is about, it looks like it's about two degrees Fahrenheit. And that's helpful to sort of understand. It's a little different. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of what this graph is showing us, let's talk a little bit about what that means for the energy. Okay, so if we're looking at the, the data, and we're trying to understand how the energy in the air might change as the temperature changes, right? So on the right side of the screen, it says Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual, than usual during El Nino years. This means that the air has blank energy during an El Nino event. So does that mean, okay, so is the temperature going up or down during El Nino? Okay, it's, it's going down during El Nino. My graph really clearly says that. So now this question is asking about the energy. Is the energy gonna go up or down? So grab your notes, I'm gonna do mine. And just jot down really quick, what, how would you fill in this blank? I'll do the same thing. Okay, what did you write down? I wrote down less. Just like that. And just like it just popped up on the screen. But I might have already known the answer because I was a teacher. So that makes sense. But I, I'm pretty sure you knew the answer too. It makes a lot of sense. Something has less temperature, then it's going to have less energy. So let's fill the blanks in here. Temperature is a measure of energy. Yes, that's right. Air with blank will have higher temperature than air with blank. Okay, so if something has a higher temperature, is it going to have a higher energy? Yes, yes it is. So air with a higher temperature or with more energy will have a higher temperature than air with less energy. Okay, so let's pull this all together. Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual during El Nino years. So that means that we know that the air actually has less energy. And that's an important thing to try to understand. But now the question that we really want to know is how does air get energy? Let's think about that question for a little bit. Okay, so we know that the source of all energy is from the sun, right? And so how does the energy transfer from the sun to earth? So when we think of the word transfer, we know that it's to move one object from, or energy from one place to another place or from one object to another object. And this illustration here of a Newton's cradle is just showing the energy transferring from one sphere ball to the next. And it does it by coming into contact. Okay, so obviously the sun is not in contact with Earth. Thank goodness, because that would be a disaster. But how is the air on our planet getting heated at all? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use two different models to, let me move my picture right there. That's kind of not in the way. So during this lesson, we're gonna use two different models. Scientists have to use models sometimes to, um, to study something that they can't observe directly. So um, we have, two models like i was just mentioning we have the model from the experiment and we have the computer model which we're going to use to collect evidence and so i'll make a video of each one that you can watch but before we get to those two models that we're going to be using to answer the investigation question let's talk a little bit about claims so we have just discussed and we know that the energy that comes to the air has to come from the sun, which is the source of all energy on our earth. And we're gonna try to figure out how does the, the air even get heated. Okay, so we understand that the sun is what heats our planet and um, the atmosphere of our planet. So how does it happen? That's what we're trying to figure out. So before we continue on, I just want to take a moment to have you jot down some ideas. So you can either use your notebook, your packet, um, a Schoology discussion or something like that to just record what do you think is happening? Like how does the Earth's atmosphere get heated? So 
um, I want you to pause the video right now and do that before watching the last little bit of lesson two, video one, which is this video that we're watching right now. Okay, so pause the video right now. Okay, welcome back. And I'm gonna show you a couple of claims that I wrote down already. So you can see if some of your ideas might be similar to this. So we have this giant star that's like 150 million kilometers away from Earth or 92 million miles if you aren't quite familiar with the metric system. Although my goal is for you to be able to use the metric system. So the, the first claim, it shows this picture here of our star, the sun, and it is far away, but the energy from the, the sun reaches our planet, and once it does, it starts heating up the molecules in our atmosphere and making them have more energy and therefore a higher temperature. Okay, so that's claim one. Claim two says, uh, claim two is a little bit more complex. Claim two has, um, the energy just passes right through the atmosphere and heats the earth first. And then the earth gets very hot from the energy from the sun. And then that is what's heating the atmosphere above it. And so we're going to set up two experiments, one using, or sorry, two models, one using equipment as an experiment and one as a computer model to collect data to try to see which of these claims is more accurate. So which one do you think is more likely? Like which one of these do you think is um, more in line with what you're thinking? Okay. All right. Thanks for watching video one. I'll see you in video two.